Well, that, that's it. I mean, my fear is the way that dissident opinions, and I, I, I respect the fact that um, my opinion is a minority one. You know, clearly in Parliament, there is a majority for vo- lockdown, lockdown. The government won those votes. Um, and the opinion pollsters keep telling us that people actually support the policy and indeed would welcome even harsher lockdown terms. Uh, I've yet to find those people myself, yeah, yeah. by and large, but nevertheless, that's what we're told. But that's why I, I'm quite prepared to accept that mine is a minority opinion. But in a democracy, you know, people are entitled to hold minority opinions and to argue them. Desmond, all right. Oh, well, I'm still alive, if that's what you mean. And no, no. Still, I'm still a Tory MP, just. <laughs> Well, I, I seen that in the news when you emailed through. I thought it, it, it's weird now, isn't it? If if you sort of uh, anti-lockdown, they're sort of trying to tie you in with other things now, aren't they? It's sort of become uh, uh, anti-Semitism, yeah. Um, and the latest thing is, um, uh, I wrote a blog I, uh, in in September. I mean, yeah, it's a very short piece. I think I, I haven't looked at it recently, but the Jewish Chronicle are on to me about it now because it was. Um, it was the time when there were there were Black Lives Matter um, demonstrations and um, uh, climate change demonstrations, and um, Jeremy Corbyn had an anti-lockdown demonstration. Not Jeremy, his brother. What's his brother's yeah. name? Oh, I can't Piers. think. No, Pierce. Yeah, 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 Pierce, and he got fined ten grand. <laughs> I, just, I thought, well, you know, the others got off very lightly and were, were policed very. Um, uh, uh, proportionately, uh, quite rightly, in my view. Um, but he he had, um, uh, you know, really copped it. And I wrote a very short blog saying, you know, am I the only one who thinks that, you know, this is a bit unfair? Um, uh, and uh, I I think I gave a quid to his, um, uh, his uh, what do you call it, legal, <laughs> legal expenses support fund. Now, of course, people have been trawling through all my blogs over the last, and so I, you know, just had an inquiry from the Jewish Chronicle. You know, do I associate myself with any of the views of Piers Corbyn on and David Icke? You know, we're all lizards. Um, ah, oh, crikey! You know, the, the feeding frenzy goes on. It, all, all it is is just questioning lockdown, isn't it? Really, you, you, you're not saying anything bad. It's just I think you should have a debate, especially in your position, just questioning: is this the best route to go? That's all. You, that's all I've ever seen you do. But the the main yeah, thing, I mean, if anything, the, against lockdown, is just bad, isn't it? Well, that, that's it. I mean, my fear is the way that dissident opinions, and I, I, I respect the fact that. Um, my opinion is a minority one. You know, clearly in Parliament, there is a majority for vo- lockdown, lockdown. The government won those votes. Um, and the opinion pollsters keep telling us that people actually support the policy and indeed would welcome even harsher lockdown terms. Uh, I've yet to find those people myself, yeah, yeah. by and large. But nevertheless, that's what we're told. But that's why I, I'm quite prepared to accept that mine is a minority opinion. But in a democracy, you know, people are entitled to hold minority opinions and to argue them. And what worries me about um, increasingly is the way that dissident opinions are silenced by a sort of McCarthyism, you know, associate. So, for example, by instead of just tackling me on the argument that I've made, you smear me with anti-vax yeah. by saying that I address. I, I told an anti-vax group to um, to, 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 to persist. Uh, I encouraged them to carry on. Well, my argument is, well, I didn't address an anti-vax group at all. You know, whilst there may be members of any group or any political party who have some strange views or even bizarre views on vaccin- vaccination, you know, the group that I addressed is an anti-lockdown group. And that's why they asked me, asked if they could interview me. Um, And that's what the issue was. To try and smear me with anti-vax is an attempt to silence you and set an example to other people. And and, and people do, do get that message. One of the things that I find very depressing 
is the number of people, particularly clinicians and scientists, some quite eminent scientists, who've emailed me with their support and with um, information that they believe would be helpful, but have said, but please, you know, absolutely in confidence, don't, you know, don't, don't ever use my name. Because they can see the way that once you put your head above the parapet, you will be attacked viciously. And that is very worrying for any future of free speech in our country. Well, even people like Carl Hennigan, Oxford facts-based university, right. like you couldn't get anyone more qualified. And people are sort of like saying, oh, it's just a borderline of conspiracy theory. And he just brings evidence to the table, doesn't he? So normal people watch people like Carl and think, oh, has he got a point? But at the moment, you're not hearing that voice at all. Are you just hearing that narrative? Be scared, stay in your bedroom. We'll sort it out for you. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and, and yeah, that's exactly the point. You know, we should have a dialogue and an argument. And one of the things that I've always said is that the government should have access to a competitive source of scientific advice. So yeah, at least if only to arm itself with the right questions to ask. Because, you know, when, it, when data is presented, you know, often enough, and I often find myself in this situation, that I'm, I'm not in a position to know the right questions to ask. And it's only a few days later, you know, when you start hearing from other experts pointing to things that have not been absolutely apparent in the data that we were presented with, which give a slightly different picture, which might have given rise to a slightly different decision. Yeah, it, it might. It, 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 the same with the Sweden argument and Finland and countries that have done it slightly different. It, if you mention that they're doing it better than us or something like that, it, it, it's weird. People can't wait for them to fill, which is a weird situation, isn't it? You'd rather like, if I was in charge, I'd be looking at every country thinking, well, they've done this well, that well, and just sort of copy. Whereas now it's yeah. it's this way. And like yeah. 100,000 deaths, I, I wouldn't really class that as a success. Whereas we seem to think, oh, but with lockdown, you can't win because if, if we didn't lock down, it would have been more. So you can't really win that argument, can you? Well, that's the, 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 my argument is that, well, we've had, I mean, some, let's face it, some parts of the country have been in virtual lockdown all along. You know, yeah, they've had very little re relief. Um, but for the most part, you know, we have been in a series of iterations of lockdown, and I don't believe lockdowns work. What they do is kick the can down the road. And we've seen that. We had um, the first lockdown, the, the, what it did was postpone the infections. When we released the lockdown, the infections began to spike again towards the end of the summer, early autumn, and then we got the new um, variant. Yeah, so, so you go through a series of iterations of lockdown until you're rescued by the vaccine, we hope. Yeah, I just yeah. felt that it was perfectly legitimate to ask the question early along. Uh, much earlier, who have said, well, look, the disease is only deadly to a relatively small proportion of vulnerable people, um, categories of vulnerable people, particularly the elderly. Uh, and we should, could we not find a way of incentivizing them to shield themselves and assisting them in shielding themselves whilst the rest of economic and social life proceeds. Um, I don't pretend for one moment that that would have been easy or inexpensive, but given the devastation of total lockdown uh, and closing schools, closing large parts of the economy, you know, it would have been um, a snip by comparison. It's, it's the same with like uh, making the decisions, like putting cancer treatments back. Like I had relatives that were waiting for cancer treatments and things like that. And we know deadly cancer is far more deadly than COVID. Pushing them back. It's like they, they just looked at COVID, nothing else. It's like just say tomorrow, there's 200,000 suicides in this country. I still don't think that would affect lockdown because it just wouldn't, it just doesn't matter. Infections, are still, you know what I mean? I, f I feel like there needs to be a bit of a balance We've yeah, I mean, I can understand the argument that, that the Secretary of State makes, uh, uh, Matt Hancock makes, 
which is that no, no, hold on a minute, it'd be worse. Because you know, if you if you don't address the overwhelming problem of um, COVID and the NHS is overwhelmed, then there'll be no treatments yeah, and slots yeah. available for, for cancer patients uh, uh, and anyone else. So you've got to concentrate on the main effort. Um, and I, I accept entirely that the government was right in its choice of the aim at the outset. The aim was to prevent the NHS from being overwhelmed in order to save lives. Yeah. I accept that as the, uh, as the overriding aim. I just believe that we could have pursued other policies to achieve that by, as I say, by shielding the people who were most likely to be hospitalised, protecting the NHS that way from being overwhelmed by hospitalizations. That would have been a better way than shutting the entire economy down, or well, shutting large parts of the economy down, closing schools and other aspects of the lockdown. It, it, it's weird as well what what, what we classed as there, uh, like work wise, like teachers saying it's maybe not safe to go into schools. I don't know if it is or not, but no one seems to care about people working in Morrison's or test schools. They, they've, they've been on the front line since March, getting barked on by a thousand people a day. No one seems and to care it, that much about them, but other jobs well, are like, not care safe. About them, uh, because if you look at the statistics, they are, of course, much more likely to have yeah, been infected. Yeah. The, the, the argument about schools is, it, it, you know, I, it's a fair argument to be had about schools. If we regard that returning schools is a priority, and it is, then perhaps that priority should be reflected in making teachers and school staff much higher up the um, uh, priority list for vaccinations. That's a fair yeah. argument to make. Equally, however... Remember, the main effort is to protect the NHS in order to save lives, to protect the NHS from hospital admissions. Well, let's be honest. Teachers are not a, a likely category to be admitted to hospitals in any greater numbers than the rest of the population, unless they have a comorbidity or unless they're in one of the vulnerable age groups, which is unlikely that they're working teachers. So it seems to me that, you know, it's not an appropriate argument to say that a healthy PE teacher in his mid-twenties should be vaccinated before an eight-year-old. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, 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 the moment you start saying, well, hundreds of thousands of teachers have got to be at the front of the queue to be um, vaccinated, you're actually undermining the effort to, vac to, to protect the NHS because the NHS needs to be protected by vaccinating those who are most likely to end up in hospital. But I do think that, you know, clearly there's a balance between the two. So let's get the most vulnerable vaccinated first. And then because of the priority we have for education, let's get the teachers vaccinated because certainly schools do struggle when so many teachers actually have to go off sick because either someone in their household or one of their close contacts um, or someone that, that they live with uh, has uh, had a positive test or they've tested positive themselves. So let's get them vaccinated. It, it's been tough for everyone. Has it, it, it's been a weird year, hasn't it? Because I'll be honest, I don't think before last year I even knew what an epidemiologist was. But but obviously now everyone's got their own opinions and things. I, I, and we're I'm, all experts. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Facebook expert on epidemiology. I, I'll admit, I, I don't have a clue really, but it, because I'm one of the self-employed people, you, you're one of the people that sort of fall through the gaps. And I, I always hate it when people say we're in it together. And you think, well, we're not really, because if you're on full wage and it hasn't affected your life, apart from maybe going on holiday and seeing your friends, that's a lot different than someone self-employed in a family that's trying to keep the house going and things like that. So I feel like there's a bit, we're all in the same storm, but not in the same boat. And I think that's what's caused a bit of friction with a lot of people. And especially in like uh, the entertainment industry. Mm. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. I, 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 my heart goes out to those people who have invested their life savings in businesses and enterprises and seeing, you know, the complete com collapse 
as a consequence of uh, of the lockdown. Inevitably, you know, there would have been an economic hit anyway. You know, as hospital in, uh, uh, hospitalizations increased, um, people would have stayed at home. Uh, people would have um, uh, been frightened anyway, and there would have there already would have, uh, and indeed there already was a diminution in economic activity before we went into the first yes, lockdown. Was, yeah. Simply as people ordinarily reacted to the um, the spread of the virus, but I think that that would have passed to an extent uh, if we'd found some more gentle way of dealing with uh, the crisis, but. We are where we are. So social media and things like that, I don't think helps because, like, just say the Hong Kong flu, was it in the 60s or 70s? That killed a large number of people in the UK. And if I asked my mum and dad who were alive then, they were like, oh, was it? They didn't even know it was on. I'm not saying this, obviously what? this is worse, but I just feel like it's in your face. You, if I put on my Facebook now, I'll have a daily de death count, a daily infection rate, and you think, is that good for people's mental health every day, just looking at this sort of material? But I think it's not just social media that. But remember, we had national TV and a radio um, in those days. And uh, again, you're right. I think 1968, it was an 80,000 death rate um, from Hong Kong flu. Uh, and you're right, we didn't shut the economy down. We didn't um, uh, react in that disproportionate way. And I think that, you know, uh, there's a lesson to be learned there. And as you've mentioned Hong Kong, let's go to the Far East when this is yeah. over and wonder how it is that Taiwan, with a much more densely populated uh, uh, um, country than we are, and we're one of the most densely populated in Europe, but they even denser than we are, they managed to get through this without a lockdown and with many, many few, fewer deaths per head of population. I think there are all sorts of lessons to be learned from elsewhere. I, it's very odd, isn't it? When you look at like countries like India and Taiwan, I think India may be struggling now, but there doesn't seem to be any like correlation between densely populated, more deaths. And I, I think the ones that got lucky, like New Zealand stopped it before it got in the country. So I think a lockdown worked there, but I, th I think our first death was in December. That means we would have had to lock down like November, really, to stop it getting into the country. Yeah, I think New Zealand being a small island, yeah. you know, is in, in, in a very different position we were a lot we you know the capital of the world let's face it london yeah. a huge international destination um and uh, I, I think you know our chances of locking down frankly well i mean I, let me be honest i'm opposed to lockdown i don't believe it's the right thing all it does is kick the the the, the, the uh, rise in infections down the road but um, i don't think we were in a position to have uh, have done that from from the outset but there are lessons that need to be learned from elsewhere. Uh, you know, there are all sorts of, I mean, but, but be careful because, you know, you've always got to be careful of comparing like with like. And, you know, when you talk about India, or particularly Africa, you have to raise questions about the death count or the infection count because they just don't have the systems yeah. to collate and, uh, 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 and, uh, so you never know that you're getting a true picture. Equally, it would appear to me that we're almost uh, as if we were keen to win the National League, um, the International League of, of claiming the most COVID deaths, um, whereas other countries are much keener to actually conceal the fact that they've had a large number of deaths. So you be careful of what you're comparing and what you're, you're looking at. It's weird with the deaths. The bit I don't understand is the 28 days after. So just say I was a healthy lad. I failed the test, but like I died of something totally different. Like I got run over or something like that. In theory, I'm, I'm going down as a COVID death. I know that. How, how does that help with charts and things like that? And yeah, I mean, I do think that is, that is ridiculous. But I don't suppose that that makes much more than a marginal difference right. to the fans. Right. But I do think there's a, a huge amount of... Um, a bit like a bit like um, uh, prostate cancer, where th they say that most men die with it 
but not of it. Right. You know, there's a huge right. number of people who will have died with um, COVID, but did they die of it? You know, they had comorbidities, they had problems. Um, uh, uh, and that accounts for, for a large part of the cohort. Uh, equally, extraordinarily, there are people who are not in, in a vulnerable age group who had no um, uh, comorbidities at all, perfectly healthy, who have died. Uh, and, yeah, yeah. You know, and we don't know why. But, I'm, you know, I, I've always thought that, you know, there was something odd about the the, the, the nature of the deaths, you know, also you, the, the, the almost complete disappearance of flu as a cause of death at this time of year. Um, and I wonder to what extent we may have misdiagnosed cases. Um, well, well, I had pneumonia. Just COVID. I, I think I had pneumonia last year before it all kicked in. And I was still working because I work for yourself. You've got to keep working and things. And all I went to the doctors and they, they took my temperature over 100 bad chests and things like that. Whereas now that would be COVID symptoms, wouldn't it? Do you know what I mean? Like there isn't much difference between pneumonia symptoms and, and them symptoms. And like you said, they maybe get rolled in a bit, but there's, there's, there's no argument. It's a dangerous thing that's going around, but it's just trying to find that balance. It's like the bit I don't understand is, I think I've seen it on the news where like 40 to 50% of people in hospital with COVID are classed as obese and we've shut the gyms and kept McDonald's and takeaways <laughs> open. And you're like, yes. It seems an odd argument, that doesn't it? Yeah, and and it, it, particularly when the gyms went to such an extent in terms of additional costs and procedures to make themselves COVID secure. Um, uh, that and again, that's something about the pubs. Given that we know that the spread of the disease is is greatest in the home. Yeah. You know, it seems to me to, to, to have been very unfair to have penalised the hospitality industry and um, uh, gyms and the like, which went to such lengths to make themselves uh, COVID secure. But the argument, the argument the government makes is exactly the same argument that it makes about schools and golf and tennis. You know, yeah. you play with, you know, it is, it's not that those activities, it's not that schools are unsafe. They're safe and they're not vectors of transmission. But the very fact that children are going to school in the morning and coming home in the afternoon generates a whole series of social activity that undermines stay at home. Yeah. And it's yeah. the same. It's, it's the same. The prime minister made that when I when I challenged the prime minister on, you know, why is it you can't play golf with someone in your own household or indeed on your own or play tennis with your wife? And his answer was along the lines of, look, you know, the moment you start saying you can go out and do X, Y, and Z, you undermine the whole concept that we need to keep everybody at home until we're through this crisis. My, my counter argument is, as, as we've already trailed over, that comes, yes, of course, if you ask the scientists, how do we stop a disease that spreads by social contact? The answer is stop human co social contact. But that comes at a huge economic and social price and consequence with devastating consequences for children's education and for the future of our economy and jobs for a whole generation. Well, that, that, that's a thing, isn't it? A lot of young people I, I know, especially in the hospitality sector and entertainment and things like that. Yeah, I know, I know comedians that are working as Morrison's delivery guys, people that have been on telly, they're on to deliver, you know what I mean? It, it's, it's been a big shift for a lot of people, but not a big shift for others. And I, I feel like the, the in it together sometimes is a bit lost on the fact that there's people like, well, my kids can't eat, I'd rather take my chances catching it at work support my family than losing my mortgage and things I've paid for for the last 20 years and things like that. So I, I think when all the vulnerable are vaccinated, is that mid-February, March? I think that will give you a bit more of an idea, won't it, with how it's going to pan out and things. Because I'd done a couple of events just before Christmas when they were doing the socially distance. And if you go to a theatre and you don't to wear a mask, you've got to stay two feet away from people. There isn't much of an atmosphere in that venue. So that that's something that they'll maybe look at, but 
do, do you have any idea what, what they're going to do with events and things when it comes out or football stadiums and sport events? I mean, I, I, I mean, I do hope that once we're through, you know, once we're vaccinated, that's it. You see, the, the, once we've vaccinated, the people who are most likely to be hospitalised if they to get infected, then we've achieved the aim that the government set out with. The aim was to s save lives by protecting the NHS, vaccinating the vulnerable who are likely to end up in the NHS if they get infected. Yeah. Is, is achieves that objective. My fear is you get mission creep beyond that. If you then say, ah, no, the, the issue is to reduce the number of deaths, well, where do you get to what is an acceptable number of deaths? Yeah. And that that then leads you into arguments about, well, why is his death of less value than my or this group's death? You, 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 once you're in there, you're you're heading for zero deaths. We need to stamp out COVID entirely. Which, you know, do we do that with road accidents? Do we stop people driving because you know so many people are killed on the roads every day? Do we do, we do all sorts of things because there are there's the possibility of death? And I fear that we are we're building up a momentum towards driving down COVID deaths, which of course sounds a you know, perfectly laudable objective, yeah. but it comes at a cost. And you've got to have some sort of assessment of you know, the risk that society is prepared to take, the level of deaths that we're prepared to take. I, you know, it's, of course, it's dreadful for those people who have died and, and we must never diminish their deaths by saying, well, most of them were over 80 or, or most of them had some sort of comorbidity and were likely to be liable to have died in the fairly near future anyway. Each one of those deaths is a family grieving and a yeah, life cut short. Yeah. And you've got to accept that. But at the same time, 17,000 people death die every day from all sorts of causes. And one of those causes is, I think, for the foreseeable future, going to be COVID-19 in the same way that we have deaths every day from flu. Even in summer, we have deaths every day from flu. Um, and that's something you live with. And I think you just have to accept that we are going to expect vulnerable groups of people to go and get their COVID jab every autumn in the same way that we expect them to go and get their flu jab. But there has to be an acceptance that we're going to return to normal life because there is a growing lobby that wants us to eradicate COVID-19. And I don't believe that that will ever be achieved. And, you know, we will live like troglodytes. We'll live in this dreadful half-life of not being able to go out, not being able to go to the pub, not yeah. being able to do any number of things, wandering around dressed like Darth Vader. Um, in the hope that we will stamp out deaths from COVID. Uh, I think that, you know, we have to consider, we act proportionately and consider the cost and the mental health of the rest of us. I, th I think that's the problem with a lot of people. It's it's like when deaths were like 20 a day or something in September, people like, it's too many. And I don't think people realise how many people die of flu and things like that. I don't think anyone's ever looked at that before and thought, oh, yeah. what? 28,000 died of flu only a few years ago. I don't think people realised it. So I, yeah. there's never any context when anything's put on. And like you say, it's worrying now they're starting to say zero COVID. And you think, I, d I don't think you're ever going to get to zero COVID. I, I, well, not in the next couple of years. It's just how, how many infections you had in this country? Yeah. Three million. It'll pass I mean, with I mean, kids. And yeah. well, What worries me is that, you know, they're already scientists talking about, you know, well, you know, come... Yes, of course, as we get the vaccination through and we'll be able to reduce um, the number of restrictions, but some restrictions will have to remain and yeah. some others will have to come back next autumn. We don't want to live like this. You know, there has to be a sense of proportion and a balance of risks. I, I think if Boris came out and said, right, we're going to get all the vulnerable vaccinated by February, last year it went away mid April, we're going to lift all restrictions by April. We just need everyone to uh, 
buy into it sort of thing. I think more people would listen, but we're, we're currently in nearly a year of three weeks to beat the curve, aren't we? So I think some people who are, who haven't been able to work are just sort of losing the will to live a bit like, oh, what? It, it's gone It's gone from like summer to autumn, save Christmas, and then Christmas to Janet. And then it was April. And then now, you, like you see, you're hearing people saying, oh, well, maybe next autumn. You're like, I don't know if I can do another couple of years of just waiting that I potentially might make some money I might be able to go on holiday I might be able to see my friends and I think there needs to be a bit of a time especially with the vaccines because we're rolling out the vaccine that's something we've done pretty well isn't it we're doing really well the vaccines if we can carry on that that's momentum the key. the key is to stick with the original mission yeah, you know, yeah. That, 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 that the first principle of war selection and maintenance of the aim and the aim was to protect the save lives by protecting the NHS protecting the NHS from being overwhelmed by hospital admissions. The moment you have got through vaccinating the most vulnerable groups, you have achieved that aim because they will be protected and therefore they will be unlikely to end up as being hospitalised and overwhelming the NHS in that way. And the, as for the rest of us, we just have to live with it. Yeah. yeah. And live with the danger. Yeah. Before you go, Desmond, would you have liked to be in Boris's position when this come about? Because Boris is one of them people. I look at Boris, I don't know him, you'll know him pretty well. He looks like a guy I'd like to go with for a pint with. He looks a bit of a laugh and things like that. But in his eyes, sometimes I, f I feel like he's been battered into positions by people. He's just been influenced that much. And you feel like he reads his speeches and he, he doesn't sometimes believe what he's reading sometimes. Would you have liked to be in that position? Well, well, no, I wonder, I, 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 let me be clear, you know, there isn't a politician that doesn't believe that he could be prime minister and would have made a, a, a good fist of it. Um, and um, yes, when, will it, my, when will it be my turn to rule? Um, yeah. <laughs> but I have a certain realism as well. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't have wanted to have to handle the problem that he has. And I, to be fair, I've been unkind. I've, you know, I've tweeted on one occasion um, you know, it, he's been abducted by aliens and reprogrammed to the dark side because because Boris was a uh, clearly a libertarian, a uh, someone who believed in individual responsibility, uh, freedom of expression and worship and uh, and association and, and all the things that that, that we um, stand by. And then he's had to become the most authoritarian prime minister since Oliver Cromwell, telling people you can't do this, you can't celebrate Christmas in, in the way that you wanted to, you can't have, you can't meet so and so, you can't see them, you must dress like this, um, wear a mask. He has clearly not enjoyed that experience at all, and you can see it in his eyes. Um, I don't dispute for one moment that both he and Matt Hancock and the others have done this for the best possible motives yeah, yeah. to save lives. I disagree. I think it was the wrong policy. I think it's the right objective, save lives. Yeah. <laughs> but it was the, I believe that there were other policy options. And I think that certainly what I would want to see come out of this is to have a body of scientists, of competitive with a competitive point of view, the Hennigans and the others, that you can readily access their analysis of the figures and the um, uh, proposals that are being given to you by the sage, the, um, the, the, the orthodoxy. Um, because I, certainly I feel as a politician, and my suspicion is that this was the case with government itself is that often enough when you're presented late in the day here's a new um strain it's exp it's um uh spreading exponentially it may be more deadly and unless you act now and do x thousands more will die and you'll be to blame when you get that on a friday afternoon are you armed with the right skills to look at the data and ask the right questions to be able to be sure 
that those scientists are on the money or these things that they have missed or are not clear to you. And that's when you need to be able to turn to equally a number of more independent analysts, be they mathematicians, scientists, statisticians, actuaries, epidemiologists, and say, hold on a minute, at least, at least tell me what to ask. Well, that, 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 sure that, that, I'm right. That, that, that's been the weird thing, like it, from outside looking in, I, th- I think we get caught up on social media where this is the narrative, everyone thinks this way, but majority of people aren't tweeting, but majority of people aren't Facebook, they're getting on with their life. And it's nice to see people like yourself, which I feel like should have been maybe Labour's, <laughs> they should have maybe really been doing that. It's not even a counter argument, it's just questioning a few things, isn't it? It's, and then if they can give the answer to them questions, it makes everyone feel better. Whereas at the minute, it feels like you feel like you're in not Nazi Germany, but it's just this is the narrative. If you go outside that narrative, yet you're, you're a bad person, you're a Holocaust denier, flat earther, and things like that. Just, just yeah. there's a lot of questions out there. It's like the gym one we just discussed. You you give the answer to why the gym one, and that makes sense. So it undermines all the other things. Whereas just asking that question makes people feel better. And I just feel like yeah. in it, at the moment there isn't many voices like yourself on telly that are doing the opposite, like asking the question that people, idiots like myself, want answered. Does that make sense? And there will be fewer. Yeah. Because when you speak out, put your head above the parapet, you get this McCarthyism, you know. He's, he's an anti-Maxi, he's an anti-Semite, you know. Uh, or, 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 and, and played in that way, then, you know, how many people are going to be prepared to stick their head above the parapet? parapet but having had this for the last 24 hours uh, um, and living in that media feeding frenzy when everybody is ringing you up and demanding an interview and pointing the finger and, and saying and you said x y and said what did you mean by that yeah. you said you told anti-vaxxers to carry on and keep, and keep keep at it persist and you think that the whole world is thinking about you and condemning you and you go out for a walk and yeah. you spot someone you know well and shout across the road to them, are they still okay? And, like, and you know, they haven't a clue that any of it's been happening at no, all. No, no. relief. <laughs> no, no, well, uh, che- cheers for coming on, Desmond. Just, just carry on what you're doing, question the narrative, and hopefully uh, I won't be eating <laughs> Aldi beans anymore. I can get out and get working again so I can make some money, but hopefully yeah. next few months oh, after vaccine. Luck. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. Cheers, Desmond. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye.